tutorial on polymers, right? And that tutorial, in that tutorial, you learn some basic stuff. You can probably tell from reading it. It was geared more towards, like, probably middle school level. It was not really geared for you guys. I'm going to get into some more detail on this. What is a polymer? As I told you, polymer, polymer, it's going to have many parts, many of the uh, monomers are going to be linked together. Large organic molecules formed from lar long chains, I should say long chains, of smaller units called monomers. And it, it illustrated in that couple of animations and in the uh, tutorial how all that happens. But I'm going to show you how it happens too, and I'm going to classify them. I'm going to ask you a little bit more information than what the uh, tutorial did. There are a few polymers I would like you to recognize because they're kind of really important. But mainly I'm going to ask you to be able to classify polymers as a, one of two different ways. We can either classify polymers, as it said in the thing, natural versus synthetic. You don't think about this, but there are natural polymers. Okay. Uh, it mentions it in the tutorial. I mentioned it in the oil uh, mar modern marbles yesterday. You know, we make most of our rubber now synthetically, but how did we used to get? Where did we used to get rubber from? Trees, rubber trees. Rubber trees aren't trees that bounce when they fall over. They're, they're, it's a sap from a rubber tree. Actually, has something in it called latex, and um, same latex you use to make latex gloves. Um, and uh, that's how you would originally make rubber. Uh, but now we do most of this stuff synthetically, right? Um, so there's two ways I'm going to classify them. Are they natural, like rubber, or are they synthetic, like we make now? Well, and there's another way I can classify them. Are they addition or are they condensation? That's based on how they're formed. So those are the two things we're going to be concentrating on. There are a few that you'll have to know. There are a few very important polymers I'll expect you to know. And I'll ask you those kind of questions you're going to see on a worksheet today. You're going to get that worksheet at the end of the period. I want to be able to teach straight through the bell because uh, I don't want to have to pause the video if I can help it. By the way, did we have announcements today? I don't think there were. We have some, so. Now, natural versus synthetic and condensation versus addition are separate ways to categorize them, but they overlap. For example, they're not mutually exclusive. For example, a condensation reaction can be natural, or some condensation reactions are synthetic. Some addition reactions are synthetic, some addition reactions are natural. So they're not mutually exclusive, you understand? What is mutually exclusive is obviously within its own categorization. Natural cannot be synthetic, synthetic cannot be natural. And condensation and addition are mutually exclusive, but not between them. All right, let's talk about, first of all, the natural polymer. We'll do the natural ones first. Well, the first one I want to talk about would be hydrocarbons. They can link together and form polymers all on their own. And one of the most, the classic ones, rubber. All right? And I have a picture of rubber uh, to decide on your paper. I'm going to show it up here in a second. But basically, rubber comes from latex, the sap of rubber trees. We still use latex. I mean, it's not like we, we synthetically make every single, um, you know, polymer. We still use latex. We still use rubber trees. But the rubber you get from a rubber tree, and what they originally used it for was not really for what you're thinking of. We think of rubber, we think of something like on a tire, something that's hard and bouncy. Okay? But reality, it, it, when they first used it, if you, right out of a tree, and you just add something to it and make it, uh, it comes really sticky and it's not very hard. It's not very durable. So what they started to do with rubber, I'm going to show you that with the next graphic here in a second after I do Gore Gum, is they actually heated it in the presence of sulfur, vulcanization it's called, and that cross-linked the different chains, and it made it harder, made it better. So you were able to make tires, like rubber tires that were actually durable, okay, but still flexible. Um, Guar gum is another one. You'll see guar gum as an additive to many things that you eat. It's, 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 it's edible. We're going to use it to make slime, though. Okay? But guar gum is in, oh, gum, but it's in other things as a thickening agent. Now, here's the same picture I'm showing here. A lot of times, I want to show you this one first. It's the same guy you have on your paper, right? 
Uh, but you can, I don't think you have, or do you, do you have this guy drawn there too? I think you do. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of times when you see a polymer, we don't want to have to draw all this nonsense out. And by the way, keep this in mind. This is a very, I could do this, which would have taken me easily two days to, comp to, to complete, to give you these notes. I can do this all in one period now because of all these graphics that are on the papers for you. I would have had to have drawn these years and years ago, okay? And you would have had to have drawn them on your paper. Well, we don't want to draw all this. It's way too much to draw. So we generally just draw the one monomer. We put a little N after it. N means what? Well, there's a certain number of them, and that N could be a thousand. It could be a hundred. You know, it could be in the thousands, okay? And they all just link continually repeating themselves. Now, rubber like this, that's not cross-linked, like I said, isn't very strong, isn't very durable, and it's pretty sticky. You put sulfur cross-links in here, and it makes it better. That's called vulcanization. But the monomer is how you would put, write it like that. Okay? So that's your first natural polymer. Let's talk about um, the second one, polysaccharides. I want to go back there. Polysaccharides is on your paper, right? I didn't want to give you the answer. I, I, I didn't mean have to come up together. Um, polysaccharides. Again, I've said this before. Think. When you want to think to yourself what something means, can you break the word down? Obviously, we know what poly means. What does poly mean? Many. Saccharide. Now, you have biology. You should know what a saccharide is. You should also know what a polysaccharide is, but saccharide. What does it even sound like? What do you think polysaccharides link together? Long chains of what? Sugars, yeah. Because, if you, if, matter of fact, the one form of artificial artificial sweetener we still call what? Sounds like saccharides. You hear saccharin, right? It's in uh, sweet and low. So that's funny. I, 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 I guess it's probably the first years I could ask that question where no one's ever heard of saccharin. Okay, saccharin used to be a, a sweetener. And before that, the word saccharin means sickly sweet. Okay, people would use that to describe uh, a novel, for example, that was, uh, you know, Melodramatic and sweet and uh, you know romantic. Um, uh, so, well, the funny thing is, none of you guys even know what the word sacra means anymore. You never even use it. But it, it was uh, used as a, the only sweetener for a very long time. Now we have Nutra Sweet and Aspartame and all those other kinds of sweeteners we use. Um, but saccharin was the first, I think, artificial artificial sweetener that was readily available. So polysaccharides means many long chains of sugars linked together. <laughs> so your monomer in this case is a sugar molecule, a glucose, for example. We use sucrose for example, in our fermentation diet. You know, sucrose is a disaccharide. You've heard that, right? Disaccharide? Okay. The sucrose is a disaccharide because it contains two glucose molecules hooked together. If you keep doing that, you'll get a polysaccharide. And those, as you can see down below, I think they have a name for them down there. Maybe I don't. Okay, well, let's see if you can recognize them. How can I link to store this stuff so I can, uh, well, how do, what do plants do to store these uh, sugar molecules? What do they do to make? How do plants store the sugar? Anybody know? What? Huh? You know, in any way, every plant does this. You don't have to be, a, it doesn't have to be a fruit. The fruits are sweet, they have sugar automatically right there in it. What I'm saying is, how does a plant store sugar, but long term storage? Well, how do you store sugar long term? Fat. Okay, that's good. There's another one, another thing called glycogen if you use that's more readily available. Plants have two equivalents to that, basically. Instead of glycogen, they've got starch. And that's what, when you eat starch, you're eating a bunch of sugar molecules linked together. And you break them down until you get the sugar that runs into the Krebs cycle and gives you energy, ATP, right? Okay, so starch is your digestible storage form of sugar. And plants make starch. They store it. They store their sugar that way. We eat the plant, we get the sugar out of it. Now, if you look down below on your paper, I think it has the other one down there. 
What is another way I could store sugar for a plant? Cellulose, absolutely. Cellulose. Cellulose is the indigestible storage form of sugar. That's what it uses to build things. It's stock, it's stem, it's leaves, the outside, the hard coverings. Okay? It uses, you know, for the stem or for the bark, cellulose. I can't eat cellulose. I can't eat bark. I can't eat paper. Okay? Well, I can, but it, yeah. it goes right through me. What's another name for cellulose in our diets? It goes right through you. Fiber, exactly. So if you eat, if you hear about a box of raisin bran, the bran is the part that you can't digest. Okay, and so that's the cellulose. That's the part you, you're going to be eating just to basically push everything else through. Here's the amazing part about these two things: the difference between starch, which is in potatoes, and cellulose, which is in paper. The difference between paper and potatoes is this. Check it out. Look at that. Can anybody see a difference between those two? Yeah, the O. Yeah. It's not just the O. It's this whole guy flipped, isn't he? See? Every other one for the cellulose is flipped upside down. Okay? Okay? That's all it is. This is a crazy thing. You know, imagine what we could do if we could just take paper and get the sugar that's in there out of it. We can. Right? We can't actually do that. We can't digest it. But we can digest starch. That's another way. And the only difference between them is how they are linked together. Okay? Isn't that crazy? Um, by the way, here's another way. I always, uh, you don't have this one on your paper. I just wanted to show this to you. Um, I, I noticed, uh, just getting uh, notes back from kids from college, a lot of times people say, well, I never saw that. What is this? Yeah, no, what is that? Molecule. You just saw it a second ago. Well, it's not glucose. It's not just glucose. Yeah, it's one or the other. Is it starch or is it cellulose? Can you tell? It's a little harder to see, isn't it? Let's take a look again. Here's starch, where they're all the same. Here's cellulose, where they alternate. Which one do you think that one is? Possibly the cellulose. Okay. Okay, because they're alternating. All right. So, basically... How I draw it is showing the three dimensions, or if I draw, I usually just draw. A lot of times in biology, we use draw it the easier way to see it. All right, shouldn't make a difference. Okay, but I just wanted to show you that little. Thing. All right, now, so we've had polysaccharides, we've had hydrocarbons like rubber, and there's another biggie. And this word sounds wow, that's a big word, polypeptide. But you know what polypeptides are. Does anybody remember from your biology class what a polypeptide is? Come on. Let me, uh, you will if I tell you what we use to make them. Polypeptides are made from amino acids. Exactly. Proteins. Polypeptides is another name for a protein. A protein is merely a chain of polypeptides that's folded in amongst itself and it's functional. Uh, polypeptides link together amino acids. Complex arrangement of them. And all of you... <laughs> It's pretty much built on proteins. Okay? Everything you do, everything you are, is pretty much proteins. What makes you different? Why do you have brown hair? Why do you have blue eyes? Why, do you, why are you so tall? Why do you, your muscles... Everything about you is made of protein. The hemoglobin, the muscles. And all those proteins are simply... A, a, a different sequence of amino acids. By the way, where does your body know, how does your body know how to put those amino acids together? What does it use? To know DNA. Exactly. DNA is your start, it's your blueprint. What's the name of the process whereby you go from DNA to a protein? What's the name of those two, actually two words? Two, both begin with a T. Transcription and translation. Exactly. So they're built by messenger RNA with instructions from DNA in transcription and translation. Now, let me stop here just for a second and tell you what we would have done if this were last year. We'd be spending a week talking about biochemistry, right? Well, we would have talked about lipids. We would have talked about cholesterol, HDL, LDL. We would have talked about that. We would have talked about, for a couple of days, transcription versus translation and how they are used, what, what, what those processes mean, and how 
um, amino acids are put together by that process. But again, we've changed the curriculum. We're not going to do that anymore. But you certainly will get that in AP Bio. You've already had it in integrated or biology class. You just probably don't remember being juniors and seniors. It was a neat process, though. Okay? You know, the, the DNA splits. The RNA, messenger RNA makes a half of a copy, and then it goes out and finds those uh, amino acids. Well, here's the part you didn't concentrate on back then. Back then, the amino acids were just different colored sticks sticking on there when Mrs. Uh, um, you know, uh, Rothery or whoever, I might even tell you that if I had bio with you. With you. Uh, here's what they really look like. The chemistry of an amino acid looks like this. Okay? You have that same picture here. Now, this is a very good picture. Let me show you what I mean by this. Why is this an amino acid? And the only difference between this amino acid and all 20 amino acids that keep you alive. That's how many you need. Everything that makes you up. This is hard to believe. This really isn't hard to believe. There's 20 essential amino acids. How many letters in the alphabet are there? Okay. With 26 letters in the alphabet, I could fill up a dictionary, an encyclopedia, and a library full of books. And every one of those books is different, and all those words put together to make sentences are all different. So it shouldn't be too surprising that your alphabet of 20 amino acids makes everything that makes you you. Okay, that's what it does. The only difference between this amino acid and the next one that gets hooked up is the R group. Whatever that R group is here. In this case, there's only one carbon that makes them glycine. If I had two carbons or three carbons or something else in there, it would be some other amino acid. But they all have this. That part, which is the acid part, you recognize now that that's an acid, a carboxylic acid, C double bond OOH, C double bond OOH, right? Here's the basic part. Did I not talk about amines just the other day? That's the amine part, amino acid. Amines are basic, right? Acids are, I mean, a carboxylic acid are acids, and everything comes together. Isn't that amazing? So they can link together. If what you think, now the best part of it, it doesn't just make a dye, like a disaccharide for the sugars. It doesn't just make a dye peptide. What can I now add on to this side? What would have to be added on to here? The what part of it? This is the acid part, so you have to add on to what? The, the basic part, which is the amine. So some other amino acid is on this side and grows, keeps growing until it's dozens, if not hundreds, of amino acids long. Right? That amino acid eventually folds itself into the thing and it becomes insulin, or it becomes hemoglobin, or it becomes something. Okay? Isn't that cool? That is all of biology. That's all of you, in a nutshell. All of you are just your arrangement. And the thing is, the difference in those arrangements is why you have blue eyes, or green eyes, or brown eyes, or purple eyes. Just the difference of those amino acids. All right. All right, so those were the natural uh, polymers. Let's talk a little bit about synthetic polymers while I make one. Ooh, I'm going to make one for a demo here. That's the second page now you're on. Okay. Synthetic polymers are obviously man-made. No surprise there. Synthetic is another name for man-made. Women don't make these. Of course women can't make these. There are no women scientists. Well, it's not a case standard. Just joking, Back YouTube here. land, don't fire me. It's okay, YouTube can't fire me. I don't work for them. Man-made, I suppose you're right, that's a sexist term. Human, no, can't call it human. Human's got the word man in there, I don't know. They're made by homo sapi, ah, uh, homo, I don't know, that's probably going to get me in trouble too. Sentient, Sentient being made. <laughs> that's what we're getting to the point. We really are. I like the new movement for unisex bathrooms. You know, guys are all in favor of that. <laughs> but girls are not. <laughs> and it's true. Because guys are messier than women. And girls have no idea. There, yeah, there's a new movement, even on college campuses, to the new movement. And you're sexist if you don't think men and women should pee next to each other. You are. That's the new thing. You should have unisex bathrooms. You should be able to walk into any bathroom. And you should be able to pee next to anybody else. And, and you know what? The amazing thing is, the more these idiotic people who, who come up with these ideas win, all right, the worse off everybody is. The worse off women are in most cases. Do you really want to pee next to him and him 
and him, and you really want to pee on the same toilet that they just went on. Really? I have a feeling the people who are fighting for these battles aren't really thinking, they're just like doing it because they, they you know, it seems like, you know, they're just to be uh, different, I guess. Who really wants this? Who really wants this? The only thing I can think of is that it's true. There's always a longer line for the women, so they don't have as many. But all right, So make more women. I'm okay with that. But do you really want to pee next to a girl? Emily, do you really want to pee next to a girl? Probably not. Okay. Anyway. So, sentient being made polymers. Also called synthetic polymers. Okay. Oh my God. That's, we went off on our uh, rant. Oh, me. How about you? All right, me. How about me? That's right. Um, some examples: uh, polypropylene, neoprene, nylon, and the one I'm going to make right here. You can copy those down, and I'll show you this one. I'm going to pour in two chemicals to make something which you've heard of. Okay. And at first, you're not going to recognize it. You know that nylon was created from, or it's named from New York and London? Hey, very good. You actually read something to that. What's that? Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'm adding two guys together. It's not important what they are because you're going to see the formula for them in a second. Uh, and uh, all that really matters is that you know well, a couple of things about these polymers. There's a few I'm going to ask you to recognize the uh, formula for. This is not one of them. Uh, the few I'm going to ask you to know the formula for will be obvious. I'll show them to you in the notes. And most of them, I expect you would know whether they're condensation or addition. Okay? Now, this guy, while he's um, reacting there, I'll show you his formula. Okay? He's called polyurethane. You ever hear of polyurethane? You know, where have you heard polyurethane? Where have you heard that word? What is it used for in? What is it used for? What's polyurethane used for? Well, first of all, it's on wood. It protects the wood. If you have, if you use buy a can of polyurethane, like paint, it's a clear liquid. It looks like this one here, this part here, and you just paint it over the top of wood surfaces, and it protects. It makes it waterproof. It keeps it uh, preserved. But I've added some other stuff to this. And you've used this before, too, perhaps. Okay? Watch this. As he... That's what I'm making here, with, along with a couple of other things. Can you look here? Can you see what's going on? Should be able to right about now. See it? See that? Yeah, actually, it's funny you said CO2, because CO2 is one of the things that's actually making this thing grow. Isn't that cool? See this? It looks like a mushroom. It looks like a mushroom. Exactly. I got some. I got some other ones down here. Here's another mushroom down here. See? I'll pass this one around. Be careful. Don't spill it. Oh, ah! <laughs> it's hard now. See? That's the crazy part about these guys. That was so funny. Yeah. They're all, they, they start out like this, but they harden. And what do we use this for? What have you... Exactly. Styrofoam, ins it's, it's like styrofoam insulation. They, ca they call it a polyurethane styrofoam insulation. Hey, check this guy out. He's a hammer. It's hammer time. See, it's a hammer. Hey, heads up. I want to hit you in the head. Catch! Hey, here's one. Like that one? I'm going to do a little... Little Chinaman's face on there. Not terrible. Well, we're talking about politically incorrect. Here, catch that. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're not showing this one here. No, we have to. I have no other choice. Yeah, exactly. That's how, what I'm making right here. Now that will be that when it's when it hardens. But I don't want to. This is it stays pretty sticky for a while. Here's the one I made this morning. Okay, now it's hard. Okay, but the other ones are from last year. Exactly. If I'm feeling this guy out here, he feels very warm. That's why I, I, one of the reasons I use a styrofoam cup. If heat's given off, what kind of a reaction is that? Very good. What would happen if I touch that right now? It would stick to your fingers and be very hard to get off. This is why I'm going to move this guy gently without making a mess. That's a nice mushroom, isn't it? 
We'll look at him later. I have in the past poured that into a, glo a glove, and then what does it do? Yeah, you get a hand. <laughs> hey, give me a hand. Can you give me a hand here? Do they use this to like make like huge costumes for people? Jake, and your oh, costume. Like, like, like a face off stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Like that, yeah. Where you have more. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I thought I heard it on that one. Yeah, face off. That's pretty, pretty neat show. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's really just good. Don't fall. Other times it's pretty good. Don't fall. How'd you get the camera film? I don't know. Honestly, I don't even know how half those guys made it. Um, anyway, okay, so back to this guy right here. I'm not going to ask you, look here. Uh, bring those, put those back on the thing over there, please. I'm not going to ask you to identify this particular um, poly, okay, as polyurethane. Okay, at least not on the test. If I asked it on a worksheet, it would be okay because you could just look through your notes and it's right there. All right, but the next few I'm going to give you, you should recognize because they are very common and uh, they're not that big of a formula to recognize, not that big of a formula to remember, and uh, they actually make sense to what we already know about organic chemistry and those states. So that's it. We talked about natural versus synthetic. Obviously, synthetic polymers, polyurethane is not the only one. Poly polypropylene, they use that for water bottles. Neoprene for like swimsuits. Nylon, obviously for nylons and other things, um, are all synthetic polymers. Okay. Now, um, let's now classify as addition versus condensation. That's how they're made, not as as in uh, whether they're natural versus synthetic, but actually in the process, what kind of a reaction is this chemically? That's what I want to talk about. An addition reaction is formed. When your monomers add without splitting anything else off, and usually this happens when you break a double bond. Now, there are double bonds in alkenes. There are double bonds even in um, aromatics. So anywhere I've got a double bond, and you saw that in the tutorial, didn't you? The, two, the bond's almost like, look at like a hinge opening up and all that stuff. That obviously isn't what happens, but you understand that you, if you have a double bond, things can add across it. You've been seeing that. We've been seeing addition reactions, believe it or not, and substitution reactions. We've seen both. But we've seen addition reactions already this year in organic for the reactions. When something adds across a double bond, as in, for example, Markovnikov rule governed addition reactions. They went to the more substituted carbon. They went there because they were more stable. And when we get to mechanisms, we'll see a little bit more about that. Okay? All right. Y'all good with that? All right, so we're going to add things across this double bond. And the first uh, good example of this is a guy that would not be surprising to anyone that he, what his name is, polyethylene. He's polyethylene because look at the monomer he's made from. Kind of looks like ethene, doesn't it, right? So polyethene, polyethylene, right? Okay? And that's what you do. Now, um, what is polyethylene? What is it? It's this. It is plastic wrap. Okay? If I take a piece of plastic wrap, one of the things that you notice about plastic wrap, uh, all this is, is these guys keep getting linked together. Now, some of you might be saying, well, isn't that just butane? No. Butane would be this. Well, yeah, it'd have, it'd have just a straight line and an H there. That's butane, right? This is polyethylene. Because if you were to draw this guy, you know, you just put brackets around and a little end. Although you wouldn't do it for two of them. You'd do it for the basic monitor of this guy over here. And it just grows for hundreds, thousands of them long. All right? And by the way, it gives, it's responsive. The reason this guy, he looks the way he does, and one of the properties of him is that he can stretch. You know that. I can stretch this without it breaking. I mean, after a while it will break. But in the beginning, it, I can stretch it, and then finally it rips. Why? Well, because these... Things are all kind of folded in amongst themselves, these molecules. So they can actually stretch out a little bit before they start ripping apart those molecules, those, those atoms. Okay? And uh, that's polyethylene. Now, this is the crazy part. Polyvinyl chloride has one little thing different. What is that one little thing different? Instead of an H here, he's got a chlorine, doesn't he? Yeah. What is another name for polyvinyl chloride? PVC. 
PVC is used for piping. Exactly. PVC pipe. It's also used for credit cards. That hard plastic that you that you know we use all over the place. Okay? So PVC piping, credit cards, things like that. Look at the difference between polyvinyl chloride versus polyethylene. And this would be one I would expect you could. I can give you half the reaction. You could finish it. I could tell you, ask you what is his formula. I could ask you to identify it. I would hope you could do that. And by the way, both of these guys are addition reactions for this reason. You take this guy, you add that guy, and you get one thing. You don't get plus something else, like you will in a condensation reaction. Condensation reactions are always going to split off some other molecule, usually water, but not always water, splits off some other molecule. I believe in the nylon reaction I, that the guy did in the video yesterday, and that I used to do as a demo, it splits off a HCl or something. You get like a, a vapor of that. I'm not positive, I forget. But it doesn't have, my point is it doesn't have to be water. It can be some other small molecule. And you can already think to yourself about the polysaccharides, the sugars, and the polypeptides. What kind of reactions must both of those have been? What was splitting off for that when you had acetobot on OOH and the amine on this side? What do you think was going to, in order for them to join together, what had to probably split off? At H2O, exactly. And that's what happens in, um, you know, polypeptides formation. In the polysaccharide formation, when a water, where sugar molecules, where there was an OH on this side and an OH on this side, you hook them again across the O, you're missing two H's in O. There's the water. And our classic example, of course, is polyester. Why is that my classic example? Because, well, first of all, you're all wearing something made of polyester. I bet you're right now. Unless you have on 100% cotton shirt, 100%, most of them aren't, they're 50% usually. Unless you have on you know, I don't think about jeans even are 100% cotton anymore, but, it, you know, most of you are wearing something made of polyester anymore, okay? What's a polyester? Now, if you think about why did I spend so much time on esters back when we were doing esters, that's the one guy I wanted you to know, okay? And I, and I did a lot with an ester. You should by now know, that, don't write this down, this is an ester reaction, right? You take the carboxylic acid and you react him with an alcohol. Agreed? And you've got two things. You've got your ester, and you've got water. Which shows me right away it's the condensation reaction. That's why it's going to be under condensation. But how can I make this a polyester? Coming off of that R, I can have two OH groups. Or two N, I should say, not or, two carboxylic acid groups. So in other words, if instead of a single alcohol, it was a dialkyl. Instead of a single carboxylic acid, it had two on there. What would it be able to do if I still had on the other side of this guy an acid over here and an alcohol over here? He can keep growing, and that's exactly what he does. That's the reaction I have below on your paper. This is not the same picture you have, but it's the same idea. Okay, take a look at this picture. You take your R group, whatever he is, however many carbons long he is. He's got a carboxylic acid. The acid part uh, boats up. One of these right there. The acid part on both sides. Okay? You got the alcohol part on both sides. You got two. Okay? Because of that, when they join, let's say these guys joined right here, okay, obviously they're splitting off an HOH and they're going to join ROC. There's your ROC. So over here is plus water. It's going to say that over there. It's plus water, water. Okay? The thing is, what can now add over here? I can have an alcohol add on that side, and I can have a car, and just keep growing, just keep going. That's what makes it polyester. Isn't that crazy? Yes. All right. So you take a dicarboxylic acid and a dialcohol, and you make polyester. Do you have those names underneath each of them? If you don't do that, dicarboxylic acid, dialcohol, dialcohol, di. Anybody else have? They all have that. So, let me just show you, last thing I'm going to summarize, and this is the same thing you have on your papers there, okay? You ever have a paper you did the quiz on? Yeah. Okay, I told you not to hand it in, because you're going to need it to do the answer the worksheet here for me, so watch this. What are some uses 
for each of these guys. And I really want this first board, I want you to really take a look at this. This is kind of cool. Polyethylene, which is saran wrap or used for you know, grocery bags, okay, is just CH2CH2. Polypropylene, which is used for the harder water bottles. These are softer, it stretches. Polypropylene doesn't so much. What's the difference? There's only, instead of CH2, CH, that's the same, CH2, CH, CH3. So instead of one of those H's, it has a methyl group. Actually, it's not really a methyl group, it's just a you know, carbon. Uh, you know, longest chain would be three. That's why it's called propylene three carbons, propylene, right? Uh, that's it. And that makes a big difference. It's still clear, but it's much harder. It's not stretchy. Now we can go to polystyrene. What did I replace it with now? A benzene ring, where that methyl group was, where that H was. Packing peanuts. Styrofoam packing peanuts, exactly. Uh, and polystyrene, styrofoam, styrene, right? Okay. Um, and lastly, polyvinyl chloride, I make a C. That's the PVC piping, right? Showed you that before. Okay. All right. Uh, some other ones that are on that sheet. Polyurethane I already did for you. And I will not ask you for either of these, most likely. Uh, certainly not on a test. If I ask you in a worksheet, you can look them up. That's fine. But I'm not going to ask you to memorize the big, long chains. But can you, I mean, those guys are used for um, also spray insulation. The, the one I was showing you before, that's the one I just did up here. And this guy, nylon, uh, different kinds of nylon can be used for picks, even for uh, and then, of course, polyester, we did that one, too. But I'm not going to ask you to memorize uh, those other ones. But should you be able to do these? Yes. They're pretty easy. They're pretty short. It should be easy enough to do. Okay? Now, I have the worksheet for you to start. Oh, and one last thing. My junior year prom, polyester. <laughs> That's right. That's the kind of stuff we used to wear back then. Only mine was better. It was this color. It was a lime green. I remember it distinctly. Yes. And it had, best part was, this one doesn't have it, but it had those stitching down the sides, you know? <laughs> That's what it was. That was me. I was hot. Like, I wasn't as hot as this guy. I mean, come on. But, I mean, he's got the shades. Two-tone. See a little darker up there? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, but I did lean on things like that with my hands in my vest pockets to make me look even cooler. I don't know. I guess they're just regular pockets. I don't know if you had the best pockets. You know, back then when we went with the um, prompt, you get a tux, you'd rent a tux. And you know what your tux, back those, those, remember those tux that had those, those uh, ruffles? Yeah. You ever see those kind? Everyone had those back then. It's all you wore was a ruffle. Now they just wear it for a gag. But. Anyway, polyester back then was much worse than it is now. I mean, if you were to feel one of these leisure suits, I mean, it felt like you were wearing plastic. It really did. They were that rough. Now, we, we integrate the polyester into the cotton, and, and we have better fibers, so that most of you would rather wear polyester than cotton, for a couple of reasons. Why don't we want to wear cotton, 100% cotton? We're hot. Well, it's not just because uh, it shrinks, exactly. It wrinkles very easily. Um, it's not necessarily as hot, although you're right. The new fabrics that you make, those, those uh, Under Armour and the dry fit stuff, is very light. It's very, it breathes. And that's true. It probably is lighter than a regular um, that you're used to, too. Uh, but, yeah, we've gotten much better than the 70s polyester leaders.